But we begin tonight with the gloves off version of President Joe Biden, who used his State of the Union address to stand up for freedom and democracy at home and abroad. In what was likely his most important speech as he runs for re-election, Biden was forceful and coherent, opening with a riff on the U.S. standing up to Hitler in the 1940s and Ronald Reagan facing down the USSR, and then putting a primetime spotlight on reproductive rights, including calling out the Supreme Court to their faces for ending the federal right to abortion. Biden issued a wake-up call on the threats to democracy we're facing, ripping the Republican Party over January 6th while using frequent ad libs to draw battle lines with Donald Trump, whom he referred to 13 times during the speech as my predecessor. I see a future where defending democracy, you don't diminish it. I see a future where we restore the right to choose and protect our freedoms, not take them away. I know it may not look like it, but I've been around a while. <laughs> when you get to be my age, certain things become clearer than ever. My lifetime has taught me to embrace freedom and democracy, a future based on core values that have defined America, honesty, decency, dignity, equality, to respect everyone, to give everyone a fair shot, to give hate no safe harbor. Now, other people my age see it differently, and I will always be president for all Americans, because I believe in America. The president energized Dems in the chamber, amped them up, really, so much so that the Reverend Dr. Raphael Warnock of Ebenezer Baptist Church complimented Biden afterward for preaching. Listen, I'm a preacher. I know a sermon when I hear one, and I heard one tonight. It's helpful to remember that Biden, who was a senator for decades, was on his home turf. He enjoyed himself so much, he stayed until the lights went out literally taking his time exiting the House chamber as he caught up with lawmakers and chatted about policy. He also got a standing ovation and fist bump from United Auto Workers President Sean Fain, who is emerging as a top surrogate for Biden's re-election bid in Michigan. It was quite a split, split screen with the assembled Republicans, who were, for the most part, silly, obnoxious, and performative, like Troy Nels, who wore, without irony, a shirt with Trump's mugshot printed on it, along with the words, never surrender, even though the photo is of Trump literally surrendering. As for Marjorie Taylor Greene, let's just say you can't elect your way to class or dignity. She put herself in violation of House rules by donning a Trump campaign hat from his past failed election bid. The contrasts with the other side couldn't be clearer, but the most damning split screen of all wasn't the MAGA clowns who were there, but rather the ringmaster in Florida, who spent the night fuming over Biden's success by using Snapchat filters to turn Biden into a Pinocchio and a dog, as if he's a petulant middle schooler with a phone and not enough homework. But the tomfoolery aside, the truly terrifying contrast has to do with what Trump reportedly did today, which was to meet with Viktor Orban, Hungary's autocratic prime minister, the dictator playdate was to occur at Mar-a-Lago, home of Trump and quite possibly our national secrets. Orban champions what he calls illiberal democracy. After losing his bid for re-election in 2002, he plotted a comeback that would ensure he never lost again. When he was elected again in 2010, he got to work quickly. He has cracked down on the media and the judiciary in his country. His loyalists rewrote the Hungarian constitution and changed hundreds of laws to keep Orban and his party in power and to render elections no more than a formality. Trump has an affinity for men like Orban and Putin and Kim Jong-un for the obvious reasons. It's an infatuation he happens to share with the American right. Is Hungary a model for Trump? Of course it is. And so away we go. After cowing nearly every elected Republican, as of today, Trump has now officially taken over the Republican National Committee. With the installation of loyalist Michael Watley, the former head of the North Carolina Republican Party, and Lara Trump, Donald Trump's daughter-in-law. Watley is a proud election denier, while Lara claims that Republican voters want the RNC to pay her father-in-law's massive legal bills. And she could be right. After all, it's a cult. It's also a Victor Orban-style playbook, seizing control of first a major political party and then any institution that stands in his way. 
We are now in a political reality where the age and experience of people like Joe Biden are viewed as a political liability, while cult-like fandom matters more. Have a listen for a moment to Beth Block, the RNC member who officially nominated Lara Trump this morning, as she invokes nothing less than God Almighty in making her nomination of her new and unqualified leader. In a world where qualifications are often measured by titles and years of experience, we are reminded of a powerful truth. God does not call the qualified. He qualifies the called. Laura Trump is the embodiment of this truth. Joining me now is Tom Nichols, staff writer for The Atlantic and NBC News presidential historian Michael Beschloss, both friends of the show. Thank you both for being here. Tom, I want to start with you first because you talk a lot about this. It, it, there's a combination of it being frightening and just deeply unserious. Uh, last night, I thought that Republicans put on a show that would have been embarrassing if middle schoolers did it. Um, it wasn't dignified. It wasn't adult. It was silly. But at the same time, it did also show that they truly have drunk the authoritarian Kool-Aid. They're all autocrat enablers and sycophants, and they wanted it to be displayed. Your thoughts? The word you <clears throat> left out is opportunists. Um, many That's of them it. are doing this uh, because they like being in Congress. I mean, look, George Santos showed up. I know. Um, you know, once they've once they've been in in the chamber, they're, they're they don't want to go home. And if um, you know, wearing silly T-shirts and funky bow ties and flouting the House rules by wearing hats is what keeps you uh, living in Washington, that's what they're going to do. But there is it is a weird double-edged sword that on the one hand you say you know these are this is just a clown show. On the other hand, you know there's clowns with flamethrowers are not funny. Um, yeah. And so, you know, it's both it's both laughable, but also deeply dangerous. And, it, and it's damaging to our democracy to have that kind of spectacle in the people's house. Um, these yeah, used I, to be serious events and they're, and they're just yeah. not right now. Indeed. You wonder what the world is, is thinking when they're watching. OK, I'm, I'm going to do something I don't normally do. I'm going to play you to you, Michael Beschloss. Here's you when we were together uh -oh. and we were talking about what we were expecting from the State of the Union. Here, here you are. All Biden needs to do, I think, is to make it clear, you know, yo Americans, a lot of people have risked and given their lives over centuries to, to protect your rights and to expand your rights. Are you really willing to give all of that up uh, by voting for a gambling opponent, someone who is an ex-president who loves dictators and wants dictatorship here? Michael, how do you do? I think he did great uh, because, see, th this is the thing. What I was really worried about was you have a majority of the American people, I believe, and I'm op optimistic about this, who love democracy. They, want, they don't want to give out, up their rights. They don't want someone ar arriving in their town square and sending their sister to a labor camp. I mean, that's the kind of thing that happens, as the three of us know, under dictatorships. And so on the issues... Joe Biden should actually have a fairly easy year. I believe in a, more, a, a definite majority of Americans love democracy and hate dictatorship. At the same time, think of you know that speech last night. He showed vitality in all the things that we've been talking about, but he also unveiled position after position that are with an American majority on things like reproductive health and, and tax rates for billionaires. He's against, against helping them you know, in the way that they are right now, that 8.2% rate he talked about. Ukraine, he's against a candidate, Donald Trump, who says to Putin, you know, under certain circumstances, do whatever the hell you want, <laughs> gun safety. So on paper, this should be an easy, winnable race for Joe Biden, especially with an amazingly strong record over the last three years. What I was worried about until last night was that people would be distracted by the illusion and the untruth that Joe Biden is not able to be president. He couldn't have that record unless you had this wisdom and skill over the last three years that comes from a half century working in a democracy. So to the yeah. extent that last night that Truman-esque performance dispelled those doubts, I think last mm -hmm. night could very well be a turning point. Yeah, I, I think it was. I think, yeah, he definitely changed, I think, the perceptions. And it's, he, he's pushed the media off of their narrative of he's old and feeble. I mean, clearly not. Right. But, you know, and Tom, I, I want to come back to you on this, because what I, what I have found remarkable, the other day I treated myself to about 10 straight minutes of listening to Donald Trump, just straight. 
And and I was and what was remarkable to well, me was how utterly <laughs> I did it so that you all don't have to. Okay, we, we have to Thank suffer you. on this side Thank of the of the camera, right? And and what I found remarkable was how utterly incoherent he was. His it sounded like his brain was mush. And and I, I said to my team, like we have to actually play a little bit. I don't like playing Donald Trump that much. But what's what's remarkable is the perception of Biden is that he's old and feeble and his cognitives aren't good. But when he actually speaks, he sounds perfectly normal, vigorous, and he sounds in control. Let me let you play Donald. Let me let you listen to a little bit of Donald Trump. I'm only going to make y'all listen to 35 seconds. Here it is. Thank you. This is an incredible group of people. So many celebrities that I'm not going to introduce any because I'm just going to get myself in trouble if I do that, because I'll leave out most of you. A tragic thing happened during the election. It was a tragedy because you wouldn't have think of it. All of the problems that you have today, I don't think you would have had any of them. We're a third world country at our borders and we're a third world country at our elections. And we have to stop that. Our cities are choking to death, our states are dying, and frankly, our country is dying. Right now, our country is known as a joke. It's a joke.